The last speaker is Dr. Bruce Damer from UC Santa Cruz Department of Biomolecular Engineering, The Origin of Life and Consciousness, New Approaches and Evidence from Science. Bruce. Thank you, Stu, and thank you, Stu, Steen, and Sarah. It's all S's here. Uh, what I'm going to bring you is a lot of wonderful pictures and some cartoons, because it's late in the day. But we worked very hard on this to really try to give you a, a really clear picture of uh, this thing that's emerging, which uh, our group and our colleagues believe we are on the tail. We're chasing the tail of the first end-to-end -end testable hypothesis for how life can begin on the Earth, or might have begun. We'll never know exactly how it begun, but we're on, we've caught the tail of something. It's frozen. Consider this when you think that AI is going to get up and, and uh, conquer the world. You, you just have to, if, if AI threatens us, if Terminator 9000 is coming through the portal to get us all, all you have to do is, is wait for the log file to fill up with errors, <laughs> and it'll go down. <laughs> so we'll be saved at the last minute. I'm going to recommend that to Arnold for the next film. So uh, here we go. So I'm going to take on not one but three hard questions, but they're fascinating ones, uh, which were addressed by the previous three speakers. How did, the, how did non living matter become animated into the living world? Very careful selection of wording there. What does a plausible, testable model of the origin of life teach us about the origin and nature of consciousness? Because when Stuart invited me to speak at the last TSC, I thought, I have no idea about consciousness. I've never cracked a book open about consciousness. And it seems like a big, complicated subject to take on. It's like too big. It's like being in a forest and deciding, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll study forest ecology. Well, you're surrounded by trees, and you just can't see the, the forest ecology because you can't see the river and the, the highlands and the lowlands. You're just surrounded by it. So I, I, my whole approach is to rewind life back to its start point a putative start point and try to determine what the properties were that led to the living world at its earliest point because it's the simplest system we can possibly study and then does that simply scale up and give us consciousness or does that teach us about consciousness? So if we figure that out or we have a, uh, some good guesses about it, how can we best utilize this new knowledge of what have, might have been our collective origins to create a more sustainable future? Because you know, heck, if we just extinguish ourselves, we won't be able to come to conferences like this anymore. So I'm going to take something out here, which I like to share. And I shared it, I believe I shared it at the last meeting. I think I shared a different one. But what I'm, what I'm holding in my hand is literally a piece of our common ancestor. This is stromatolite from northwestern Australia. This is about 3 billion years old. And these little textures, you can't really see them. I could hand this out if people wanted to pass it around. Uh, this, this, these little textures, these ridges, are laid down by microbial mat communities that's, that cement sand grains together, and they, they stack up. And this is the dominant fossil in the record of, of life on Earth for three billion years. These guys are what ch transformed our atmosphere and our oceans and prepared for soils, and they prepared for life. So this is ground truth, uh, this, this particular rock. The one that's on screen is uh, part of a new discovery from uh, south, uh, another part of northwestern Australia. It's actually hot spring preserved stromatolite, and we'll get to that later. But this one's 3.5 billion years. I broke this open out of a slab, and it was like, oh, look at those red nodules, new stromatolite uh, morphology in, in, a, in a barite mineral. See a little closer look there. Amazing stuff that this is even exists still. So where did this all start? Well, it started with a nerdy kid at age 14 without a computer because there were no computers in our town. So I would do computing in my head. I would design board games, and, and I was an obsessive programmer without a computer. And I was walking in these hills outside Kamloops, British Columbia, Canada at age 14, and thought, 
wouldn't it, you know, what are these beautiful flowers coming up? It's about this time of year. They have structure that is beautiful and complex, but they come from a bulb or a seed or something that's, that's simpler. But how did this exactly happen? Well, my little brain sort of went down and tried to run the algorithms of this seed or bulb. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. These all come from a single seed or bulb way back. And my little brain went back through time searching for the common seed, the first seed. And then something started to happen. I started to get some kind of a transmission. And you know, you're 14, you don't know what, you know, you've got too much imaginative juices, too many hormones too. Uh, but this flower was my question mark. It was a mariposa lily. But I had just read a biography or an article about this guy, Albert Einstein. And at 16, this guy was coming up with, by doing thought experiments, uh, had a dream of running alongside a beam of light and, and he could see the sort of compression waves in the light and that led to special relativity and I thought well that's the way science is done you do thought experiments so I started walking back toward the house and this thing appeared in my field whatever it be my third eye or I didn't know what a third eye was you know I still don't uh, but this it was a seething mass of molecules and they were like a clump of molecules that somehow like Lego bricks had gotten put together and they were sort of doing something and I thought, oh, I can ask this thing. It must be a thought experiment. I'll ask it. And just as I was about to ask the, the bubble mass or the molecule, molecular mass, you know, how did it all begin, it asked me a question. It said, figure out how we made a copy of ourselves. And my little 14-year-old brain flipped into, well, you're a machine and if you have an automobile, you need a big factory to make an automobile. I don't see a big machine around you. So it's not plausible. And it winked. I work on it. <laughs> so I went into computing. I finally got a computer, <laughs> PDP 1134 at the local college. Uh, it was actually booted up with a tape bootstrap. There was an option to do that. So. I started studying these, these bootstrap idea, like how do we get our system up? Well, we just feed this thing in and it starts up services and whatnot. And I then conceived of the, maybe the, the origin of life had to start with a random puncher, like a paper tape puncher. And that that paper tape would generate random program tapes, just random, and be read into a simple computer. This is a Altair 8800 from my collection in my barn of all places. So the computer is fed by energy, and the computer cycles continuously, pulls the tapes in, tries to uh, reads the codes, tries to run the programs. The programs are run in its little processor that cycles and cycles and cycles with energy. And the programs mostly crash out. They don't do anything, and they're thrown in the crash trash. But programs sometimes do something. They light up the front panel. And here's one that's program A lit lights on the front panel and didn't crash the system. So it's selected and it's appended with new random programs B, C, and D, extended. And my conception was that then, well, that could create a more advanced program, which it actually might sort of create the computer too. So now we have a screen and a keyboard. And say program A, C did the trick for that. Well, you go on and like, well, how does the computer evolve? Well, well, A, C, F, another random program, makes a laptop after a very long period of time and ACFI makes the smartphone. So this was a conception of an evolution of software and hardware together. Very slow and cumbersome and efficient, but it would work if you had the right system. So then I started to scratch my head and think, well, how does this map, if this is how you could boot up an OS in the, you know, randomly with no programmer, how would you do it chemically? Well, here it is, chemical bootstrap. So this fades into the background. What are the parts that we need to do that? Well, you need some kind of polymerizer that takes a source of your organic building blocks. Think of the, the punches in the paper tape. You need a source for that and some kind of magical polymerizer that squeezes these little building blocks together and makes these long strings to make polymers. And there are your programs. You know, we're all made out of polymers and polymers are cycling and building themselves over and over again in our, our bodies by their quadrillions right now. So where do the polymers go? Well, I then thought, hey, Darwin in 1871 wrote a, a letter to a friend that said, I'm 
you know, I think that some warm little pond somewhere, there would be a combination of phosphoric salts and energy and et cetera, and a protein compound would form and get more complex. Like, whoa, he nailed it. That is the fundamental insight. So here's our Charles Darwin. So our computer is a cycling little warm pool that's driven perhaps by a hot spring or by day-night cycling. It goes up and down. What are the programs? They're protocells. You heard the, the previous speakers talk about them. Little membranous compartments that contain the little random programs. And those protocells either pop or they do not. So here's our Charlie Darwin doing the natural selection thing. And they either survive or they don't. And this could be a system of evolution of software and hardware together in biology. It's real simple. It's like a nerd kid's solution to the problem. So we went looking for it. And we found it. And we found it in collaboration, because you can't do anything without collaboration. And in 2009, I met David Deemer at UC Santa Cruz. And he's one of the world's greatest membrane biophysicists. And he had discovered how to do this thing. So we, we made a partnership. It's been going for all these years. He came, basically, when I walked in the lab and I said, I have an idea of combinatorial selection for the origin of life from random things that are then encapsulated and then selected, he said, come with me. <laughs> and he came down, and, and in the lab was this, like their first combinatorial selection protocell generating machine that they had just gotten built in the shop. And it works. So for example, here's, there's a little, there's nozzles here, and the little dishes, about 24 vials, and we, the, the machine hydrates the vials, and it dehydrates them on the other side. So that it's, the system's rotating these little dishes around so they, they get wet and then they get dry. And within each dish, he added a lipid of various kinds, and lipid is what makes your cell walls. You know, lipid, we are just walking bags of lipid, basically. Uh, and a CO2 atmosphere, 85 cent centigrade, a pH of about three, a little bit acidic, helps things along. And it turns out that what happens is when the dishes dry down, you get these, these lipid, there's your lipid, and you get all these little building blocks of life, these little, what are called AMP and UMP, the building blocks of RNA, squished together in a two-dimensional world, and then they, the water then dries out, goes out through the, the layers, and they go click, 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 like a zipper closing. You get poly polymers formed without the need for an, an enzyme, without the need for biology. This is probably the only way nature had to make biopolymers before it was biology. So it's like the chicken and the egg, right? The chicken and the egg, you can't make a biopolymer because you're not biological yet. Well, you can, you just dry the solutions down. And this is the reaction, it's called a ester bond or, or peptide bond reaction. So, what we did was then run all of these solutions through our, our gel analysis and these, these squiggly kind of dark bands show that we've grown, we've made a, a kind of a, a synthetic RNA in a four hour cycle, just instantly. And Dave invented a technology called nanopore sequencing. And this is the blockades formed when we have our RNA going through a, a pore. And this is definitive. We, we're able to make these polymers in large numbers they're all random. Between 40 and 150 little base units together, just, just make them, make primordial soups. Others are now making peptides. So this is now spread throughout the chemistry community that is working on the origin of life, wet, dry cycling. Wow, it's a pump. It's a, uh, like what Stuart was talking about, it's a ratchet. It's a, a system away from equilibrium. So here I am, 40 years after committing to work on the origin of life, standing in a very dangerous and awkward place in bumpus hell, pl uh, trying to test this not just in, a, in the laboratory in little dishes, but in the field. And this is in a uh, volcanic field in Mount Lassen National Park. We're on camera using up our last experimental tray that we didn't destroy, placing it into the fumarole vent, having wafts of gases at about 95 Celsius come over the trays, not getting crud and stuff in the trays, which kind of wrecks your chemistry, just to see whether vent gases alone, not just hot water, but humid vent gases could actually uh, polymerize RNA in the field in a prebiotic analog, and there it is. Just a little bit of product, a little bit of product. And we'd actually put 
our solution right onto mineral chips that we picked up from around the spring, and they were, the surface was one mole or sulfuric acid, so it would eat your genes away, and still worked. So Dave is a great believer. Go to the field and try this in the field. It will teach you more than any laboratory work or, or theoretical work. Just go and try it. So we did. Last summer, we were challenged by a, a fairly famous geologist. He says, your, your protocells, your little bubbles will never work in a hot spring setting because in the, in the alkaline environment of high silica, they'll just get, you know, you can't do your organics in that. And in the clay, there'll be little floating uh, clay mineral particles and they'll absorb, they'll just take out all your organics like, nah, 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 nah. He's the front row question asker, this, this fellow Steve. <laughs> name will be remain nameless. So I said, all right, I'm going to Yellowstone with the field season and we're going to try this live. So here's one of the springs we picked. And these are, if you've been there, these are wild. They look like alien landscapes, you know. So this is a silica a spring, alkaline conditions. There's a little silica gel coming out of solution and becoming mineral, becoming sinter. And there is a gradient. You can actually see this gradient of no life in the spring. And then you get this chemical eating life. And then a little bit further away, when the temperatures are low, you get, you get uh, sun feeding life and all the way down to green life. And there's a clue there. There it is a little bit better. And there's, there's green, uh, what are called endoliths, in all of this center mineral. And there's me having scooped out some of this hot spring stuff, put it into the vials, and you're clearly forming vesicles in there. There's that milkiness there. So we had dry solutions of lipid, and, and we were able to form vesicles and encapsulate DNA and RNA in Yellowstone waters. We took water out of the ocean, couldn't do it, crystallized everything. It's, it's helping, in a sense, put the nails in the coffin for the idea that life can start in the oceans, because you can't make the polymers without drying. You can't make little compartments because the salt just crystallizes them. If you try to wash your hands in soap and seawater, it, it's a really funny thing, right, because it turns to curds. That's why the ocean cannot support compartments. Life needs to actively pump salt out of its system in order to survive in the oceans. So here's what it looks like in the lab. After going through these cycles, those little glowing spots are DNA encapsulated in the vesicles. And in this particular solution, we have a trillion compartments in one run. A little dish, trillion compartments. So let's take a look at the whole scenario. So here's our Hadean Earth. This is 4.2 4 4 billion years ago. Nice volcano. It's a very nice sunny day. You can see the dusty disk of the formation of the solar system, and planets are still sweeping through it. And our planet is like a vacuum cleaner going through the dust and and meteorites, and there's a you know, 100 million times more material raining down on the Earth. That turns out to be the material that's the feedstock for life. Fatty acids, amino acids, and even nucleobases are coming in. They're raining like, practically like snow, concentrating in pools on land where they can get concentrated enough to do the chemistry. And this ideal little pool is driven by a pump called a geyser, which tend to be, operate on a regular basis. And within that pool, you can get this magic happening a wet cycle, a dry cycle, and a moist cycle. Just like when you put solution bathtub uh, soap bubbles in your bathtub for a, a soapy, what is it called, bubble bath, it creates more bubbles, and then the bathtub drains down, dries out, you refill it, and what happens at the edge of the bathtub? A bathtub ring forms. And that's layer upon layer upon layer of lipids, and in between those layers, a huge chemical factory is going on. So this is our cycling system. This is our engine. So it's all about cycling. The system has to continuously cycle to continuously make new polymers. The other ones are breaking down. Encapsulate them in the bubbles, test them. And then what happens is you get this sludge that forms at the bottom. And it's like a community structure. This is where the network boots up. Because within this community of protocells, you have the possibility of having metabolic processes and Stewart's autocatalytic sets occur because the pond level is drying down, the sludge is at the bottom, and you have a concentration and stuff forcing through membranes, and a network effect takes over. So some is greater than the, uh, the, uh, the parts, as, as Sarah was talking about. So we then had the insight that this sludge that continues to grow in the bottom of our dishes is our common ancestor. It is the unit. It's a communal unit 
using a, a, a kind of booting up chemistry that is the, the ancestor of the progenote, the Carl Woese, George Fox idea from the 70s of a boot up phase of life, and that we may have found it. And I went to uh, George Fox's office in University of Houston. We showed him the entire thing. He said, I think you are on the path to the pro progenote. It's very reassuring. So let's take, this is the entire model as presented last year at one of our major meetings. Let's go through it. We, it's got seven steps. Everything has to have seven steps, right? So this is the hot spring origin of life model. So we start with synthesis of, of, of a huge amount of our organics in space, a feedstock. You need a continuous feedstock. They come and they land, say, in our nice little caldera there in the various pools where organic chemistry starts to happen. Uh, you get enough concentration and, and sharing between pools, different pHs and what, you get a lot of complex products like my cells. Then perhaps uh, you get a feed stock thing into an ideal pool driven by cycling that cycled, you know, for, it could be just a year or two, it doesn't have to be long periods of time. You get our cycling going and you generate the progenote. And as the progenote becomes more robust as a unit, it's distributable, that's the key. It can get out of the pool, can be washed out of the pool to another pool. Why? Because this pool's conditions may change. It may fill up with junk or never fill again. Or it can be blown by wind, not surprisingly. And stromatolite communities still distribute by wind. It's a widespread mechanism, dried biofilms, of early form of almost like seeds. So you get a combinatorial landscape of progenote communities that are sharing, developing innovations under different stresses and sharing them back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So you have a powerful evolutionary computational machine on this landscape. And once the, the progenotes are distributed into dilute solutions where they can no longer feed on the chemicals of the hot spring, they start dying. What do they have to do is when, when they can't feed, get a free lunch, they have to make their own food, which means energy capture from the sun. So photosynthesis, we predict, comes in early, and it comes in right at this point where, where you're leaving the, the chemical feeding zone. And then we predict here that the actual beginning of cell division, which can, can occur within a communal mass, is if a protocell's in solution, it tries a, the trick of dividing itself. Think of dividing yourself, you know, walking along the street. I'll think I'll make two of me. It's not gonna work very well. But if the, if the protocells within the community structure and it just, a few innovations came together to make cell division happen, then you have the transition to the living world, but it can happen safely in the communal co context. So that's, that's the current thought experiment. So once you get robust, distributable microbial communities, and now these are early microbial communities, they can distribute and they head toward, they get washed down toward the ocean, they get salt comes in and starts to blow up their membranes. So then they have to learn how to actively trans transport the salt out. Once they've done that, they can globalize because then they can reach the marine shoreline, which has got incredibly high tides at this point, very, very violent in, in environment. The oceans are coffee colored, they're full of dissolved uh, iron. And so, but they can now globalize and you get this you get stromatolites that are visible everywhere in the fossil record. So this is what I mean by end-to-end. -end. It, involves, it involves so many aspects of science. So many colleagues worked on this for two years, on this diagram. And it was picked up by this magazine and put on the cover in August, uh, which we're very proud. We bumped the uh, eclipse off the cover, and uh, we asked the editor why, and she says, I'm a microbiologist. And I think this is one of the most important stories we'll publish in this century. It's like, woo! <laughs> and they're republishing it in July in a special issue on 21st century science. So uh, what they did is they took uh, my drawings uh, and made this beautiful treatment of the landscape for the public with this spiraling system going around and around, wet, dry, and moist, wet, dry, and moist. They did a beautiful job. We're actually working on a full animation of this now. So guess what? This is the same cycle that's happening today outside. This is from my window, looking out from my window of my uh, room here at the hotel. And what's happening? A moist cycle is happening. Soils are still moist, springtime is happening, metabolic activity is, is cranking. And these little guys, these barrel cactuses, have learned the trick of, con of keeping water to keep that moist cycle going, while other plants dry completely down and have to make seed compartments to go on. So the, 
you're seeing the wet, dry, moist cycle, wet, dry, moist cycle uh, from the pattern from this origin pool still in biology. And your body, biology learned how to kick water out in between the, the stitching together of polymers and say, yeah, water, you're in the way, get out of the way, I wanna make a piece of DNA. And that's called enzymes and that, they used ATP to do that. So you have learned how to dehydrate yourself while being still moist. You don't have to dry down completely. So that's how one of the things that biology took over. So how does this actually help us look for evidence for life on other worlds? I'm one of the, th I'm a, a team member, one of the three landing site teams for Mars 2020, an upcoming rover. And we're arguing that NASA should go back to this place, which is Columbia Hills, where the rover Spirit, uh, its back wheel stopped turning at some point, and it was just about to finish its mission. And they used the wheel as a trencher, and they trenched up this white soil. And this is not snow, this is opaline silica. And they realized we are driving over an old Yellowstone hot spring. We found it. Talk about needle, needle in a haystack on Mars, right? There's known hydrothermal springs, ancient ones. There's no water flowing out of them all over the planet, but we're, we're sitting on one. And it turns out that these, these rocks here look just like the digitate uh, silica rocks you find in hot springs in, say, in, in South America. So we're proposing that we should go back to Columbia Hills and break rocks because we may find something like this, like these textures. We have a shot. It's a very short, small shot. Because Mars went out of the habitable zone, and if there's any life at all, it's deep in the crust. But if hot springs are active over Mars's history, they bring that biota up and have it be active for periods of time on the surface, and they may lay down textures that we can recognize in situ, not for having to bring samples back. But we're in an uphill battle. There's three landing sites left, and, and we're probably third at this point. So what does this have to do with consciousness? Well, this is the dream that I did when Stuart Hameroff invited me to come to the conference. I asked myself, what is, what is happening at the boundary between physics and biology? And I had this dream one night and I said, well, uh, is it necessary to have a guy in a white beard and a lab coat standing there at the origin of life as the first protocells are forming and say, I'll remove these carbon atoms five angstroms to the left. And the dream said, no, that's an unnecessary complication. It's a cranky dream. It said, let me show you how you were made. So here's the results of the dream. Thought experiments rock, by the way. So first it showed me the undulating plane of physics and said, push on one side and it'll undulate predictably. It's, it's uh, an entailed system. It's one of Stuart Kaufman's like, you know, it's a predictable system, it's physics, you know. But then suddenly inside the, the the uh, undulating plane opens the first protocell, which has a, a transmissive membrane. And what it can do is crowd things together. By crowding things together, you end up with higher probability of things happening. So it asked me the question, what's going on? I think, well, it's sort of like a probability machine. And then it showed me two protocells, the dream, the thought experiment showed me two protocells with stuff transmitting between them. And it said, what are you looking at? It said, some kind of a message passing is going on in this system. And then it created a larger mass of protocells and said, well, what are you seeing? And I said, well, it's kind of nonlinear. As soon as you add more protocells, you get more transmission. And then it was a, a fan of Descartes. So it showed me these three Cartesian plots. And one of them was probability screaming up, uh, interconnections or interactivity climbing, and then asked me what the third part was and that's uh, information, that's uh, memory. So the whole system comes together as a machine that starts with probability, creates interconnection, and then generates memory. Interaction network, memory system. So what this is is a Copernican, potentially a Copernican recentering. Copernicus centered our understanding of the universe on the sun, but this generative system could center our understanding uh, and our, our fields of inquiry for all these fields. Let's go through these quickly. Political economy, how physics creates information, complexity theory and AI. Is it an engine of creation? So my prediction is that this uh, fundamental properties generate, this engine, this system generates all observable phenomena and all felt experience. And that we're only just starting to feel this field, feel into this field. We're great instruments sensing this field. 
So here's, this is uh, the last part of the model, a cycling roadmap to consciousness. We start with cosmic cycling, this is two phase. We go to origin and early life, which is a three phase system because it, it can produce memory. Then we end up with neural dynamics, which supports learning. Then we go to consciousness and see how this goes together. Physics of the universe is on off. Doesn't have much of a memory system. Add biology, you have memory. You have this three-way cycling engine. Neurons support learning part of the way. Get enough neurons amassed and you have a fifth cycle which is awareness of itself or conscious self-awareness. And perhaps this entire cycling system from physics all the way to consciousness, when it becomes awareness of itself, looking at its own origins and evolution, it provides an opening for the experience many of us in this room have felt, which is the experience of a unity consciousness. So in answers to these three questions, how did non-living matter become animated into the living world? Through a three-phase cycling engine, no need for supernatural creator or pre-existing consciousness. What does a plausible, testable model of the origin of life teach us about the origin and nature of consciousness? Consciousness emerges from on the substrate of the living world and is characterized and couples into continuous cycling of probability shaping and interactive networks in a memory system. Now here's the, this I'll, I'll wrap up with this, this is the, the real take home point. How can we best utilize this knowledge of our collective origins, if it is, to create a healthier and more sustainable future? I posit to you that biology's central operational influence on the world is to shape probability to bring unlikely objects and events into existence. So prediction, we can explore and formalize methods to shape collective probability, this field, for future outcomes. And just as protocells did this uh, for their survival, our conscious intention and attention can work in the following way, and this is the take home for maybe the spiritists among us, or the, uh, is that the future, from the present to the future is valleys of likelihood and probability. And into those valleys, if we have an intention, we, we open the first valley, roll the stepping stones, that if we pick them up, they're actionable items. And as we pick them up, they open the future path of uh, synchronicities to start happening. And we get to an amazing future, like being here, uh, here at the conference. So you can test this hypothesis in your own life, set an intention, pay attention, take actions and measure outcomes. And my own, this is a conclusion here, my own example, my own life, I, I give to you as a, as a test of this hypothesis, my relentless conscious attention on the origin of life problem brought a highly improbable outcome into reality. Starting with Albert Einstein, getting the thought experiment, getting the model that's now te testing in science, 40 years. The last question I'll leave you this, with this is this. What generated the thought experiment that I had? Huh? Where did this come from? Because we can't know everything, right? Let's leave something as a mystery. So the precise source of what we might call synchronicities, miracles, the muse or puppeteer, as mentioned earlier, mind at large or cosmic intelligence will perhaps always remain the greatest mystery. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's have a couple questions for Bruce. Can I ask uh, Steen, uh, Stewart, and Sarah to come on up? Uh, we have, uh, 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 we're a little short on time, but uh, we'll have uh, some questions. Can, thank you. That was uh, brilliant, um, but I have a question. If uh, this process is so easy in a way, why do we all have a common ancestor? Why hasn't life started multiple times? Yeah, that, that's, that's a big one, why we don't have, uh, why we have a common ancestor. I mean, there's people who work on that, and in a sense, it's the roots of the tree of life where you come into coherency with one genetic code and one set of tools, but certainly uh, the roots of the tree, the tree of life isn't really a trunk either. There was all this divergence. So um, it's one of the great questions of biology 
but certainly early on everything was horizontally transferred and there was multiple starts and multiple failures all over the place. I mean, why isn't there, why aren't there starts now? Um, generally, modern biology would eat them up and oxygen would interrupt with their chemistry. It prevents pr future starts. Thank you, Bruce. Great job. This is Sky Nelson over here. Thank you. I've seen your work a few times, and it gets more clear each time to me. Uh, so I'm wondering about this idea of synchronistic evolution, which I think you hinted at. Um, instead of just pure natural selection or probabilistic or combinatorial selection, that there's a meaningful element or meaningful selection process. Uh, and if that's the case, do you think that happened at that first step with chemical evolution, or did it happen when uh, sun feeding began? At what point did we need a more meaningful synchronistic process to step in to speed things up? I think that as soon as you had energy capture, so the difference between feeding from hydrothermal energy, from heat energy and chemical energy coming up from the hot spring and, and capturing sun, they're really high, solar energy is very high quality. And I wanted to mention this for, for Stuart here. It's the first sort of connection in the sense with quantum effects and biology because when you're capturing solar energy, you're probably doing it with polycyclic hydrocarbons, which can bounce photons around because they're landing in from space. You have a high-grade energy coming in. And I think that that really kick-started the, the, the world, the living world. And the prediction we had is in some epithelial layer of a progenote, that's where the first dividing cells would have been. The energy-capturing protocells did the trick of division. And then they created this sheet of of fantastic productivity on top of the rest of the community and sort of the late progenian. Thank you. Hi, I'm Avtar Singh. Um, fascinating story and time history of origin of life and how it evolved. The question is, do you think the origin of life is same as origin of consciousness? I'm, I'm pretty much a gearhead, so I think consciousness is a kind of OS and needs something to run on. So I think that if you start at this, you know, the, the state of sort of conscious sensing in the world of the progenote or the world of microbial communities, which is 90% of the history of life on Earth, is different than when complex organisms, plants, and animals come. It's just different because it had to boot up very slowly and build its interconnection, build the OS that could run something as complex as our sensorium, even, and then our mathematics and our symbology. It just... You need a long time to do that because you need three billion years to just get the oxygen in the atmosphere. Yeah, so my specific question is, isn't there an element of our living uh, universe or consciousness which is guiding the processes which led this matter, inanimate matter, to, to get into a, a living body? That, that, got, that process itself that moved it from A to B isn't that process itself separate from the, what is happening to the inanimate matter? That, that's why in my dream, you know, I pictured the guy with the white beard. Did you, you know, because in a sense, any kind of complex system, an AI or a god or whatever, that could guide the origin of life would have had to have been informationally massive, right? Because it's dealing, in, in fact, it's implausible. Uh, that so, because the system is based on so much random outcome and so much tries and retries, I think a god would get very bored with the process very quickly. Uh, I don't think it's necessary, you know. Uh, 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 yeah, okay. okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, we'll take the questions in. Thank you. Uh, we'll open it up to the whole panel. But let me, let me address that, take the chairman prerogative to the last question, because I was going to ask the panel this, that a lot of people... Uh, neuroscientists, uh, Tononi, Koch, uh, who are no slouches in neuroscience, and a lot of other people think that are panpsychists. They think that consciousness is intrinsic to reality. And Penrose and I have a similar idea for collapse, so, which would mean that con some form of proto-consciousness was present before life. Now, most of you, I think you would all assume that life emerged from consciousness, but you could look at it the other way around, in which case... Uh, life uh, could have originated and evolved because of feelings, for example, reward. I mean, all our behavior now is due to reward, right? Uh, rats in a maze, are, we come to this conference for reward of different sorts. So is it possible that life originated and evolved to feel good? Yes or no? <laughs> you may be living in that universe. All right. Uh, 
All right. So uh, my question is uh, around the, the the projections that Bruce wants to to see. Like I come from a, a field of uh, uh, design thinking, so we do pro fast prototyping all the time to try to come with the best products. Right. That's how the iPhone became the dominant one, as opposed to the the other types of products that have been for 40 years. So fast prototyping is very important in order to discard all the trash. But fast prototyping requires that you don't censor yourself and a degree of naiveness, right? So you allow that all these experiments happen. And my concern is that sometimes I feel that we censor ourselves too much by either theories or by either uh, biases and we don't allow these experiments to happen and we also you know tend to like uh, like just basically not do things as, as you did you went to the source and I think that's the lesson I, I, we keep doing this all the time you know in our in, uh, the design schools like just do it just prototype 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 and learn and learn and learn and I feel like there's a lot of people who miss that opportunity of prototyping rapidly so uh, do you think you, we need to stop with the censorship allow ourselves to be more creative and to create stupid experiments and to create those experiments that may sound naive and, and not, and not uh, useful because those will lead us to actually find the good ones. Yeah, that's, this is a big one because, you know, anyone who has a hypothesis that doesn't sort of try to test it and falsify it may fall in love with their idea. And certainly in product development, this happens. But there's an actual test. You, you, your company fails. You know, you get selected out if you fall in love with your product too much and not test it with customers. And rapid prototyping is key. It's the, the way nature works. And so even in the spiritual and in, intellectual domain, if we fall in love with these ideas, the mind can create an infinity, infinitude of rabbit holes to go down. I mean, I think this academic is, academia is rife with rabbit holes. And it's only those that are the brave souls that go out to try to falsify their approach and test it that don't basically live to the grave with their closely held idea and are actually able to evolve. And this is true in intellectual pursuits. So it has to come down to testing it in the world, you know. I don't know if I addressed the question. No, yeah, no, it's just uh, an extension of what you said, yeah. Thanks. Travis. Thank you very much. Great presentation by everyone. My, my question is for Dr. Dahmer. You, you were saying that uh, uh, you were thinking that the, the process of uh, capturing and dissipating light was where life really got kickstarted. My question is: is in the in the really Earth early early Earth environment, you would have had a lot of UV uh, uh, photons hitting the Earth. Your polyaromatic hydrocarbons are strong absorbers and dissipators of that type of energy. Do, do you think that that is a, a possible mechanism that that these polyaromatic hydrocarbons are absorbing them, dissipating them, and forming some sort of dissipative structure to to retain them and as opposed to having um, uh, yeah, that's degradating effects? It, it precisely. Um, in fact, uh, it, for years it used to be believed in our field that high ultraviolet was detrimental because if you, know, if you go out, in a, especially out here and you don't have sunscreen and you're really sensitive, you're, you kill your sin, skin cells and you get sunburn, right? It's pretty tough on biology, but that's because biology uses long string polymers that get broken easily. But in the early, in the, say the progenian epoch, there would be very short polymers doing one job, or what I, floating around, and so they're way less sensitive to UV. And Sutherland's group in the UK have shown that UV chemistry can actually create uh, ready-to-go nucleotides. There's a pathway, so now the entire field really is, is turned back to the warm little pond. And yes, uh, Dave Diemer pr wrote a paper about 20 years ago that said polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, there could have been the first pigment. So you can imagine, I'll just do one, one thing that if you go through, if you took a biologist and a geologist through a time portal back 4.1 billion years, they would find a pool full of sludge. The geologist would say, I can't break that with a rock hammer, so it's not geology. The biologist would, would pipette that and look at it. It's like, it's just full of a bunch of random junk. It's not biology, it's not geology, it's not biology. And then they, they come back 100,000 years later and all the sludge has gone black. It's like black which is stromatolites have this black pigment, a lot of them on the coast. And then so the geologist says, well, it's still not hard, so it's not a rock, and I don't care about it. It's just sludge. And, but the biologist pipettes that in the sequences, and he finds a little genetic sequence, a little DNA-like thing that winds and unwinds with hot water, and it makes some kind of a pigment, and that's why they're all black. Evolution's underway. Now they're capturing energy. Now they're 
free to go to any aqueous environment. So that, that's just a prediction. Thank you. Thanks. Over here. Hey. Um, yeah, kind of like following uh, Hammerov's lead a little bit, if any of you may have like a thought of um, where happiness and suffering come into the picture of the origin of life. If you imagine the progenote, if you imagine a protocell, um, as I mentioned, and, and my wife Catherine talks about this too, the selective advantage for being able to sense its world, evaluate good or bad for me, and act on it reliably would have been enormous. Um, so I would like to imagine that those processes emerged you can say that it emerged without or with some kind of conscious or sentient experience. I don't mind the notion of sentient experience at all at such an early stage. But in any case, the, the foundation for pain and suffering and joy are in that. Foods that way, poisons that way. But you need consciousness for that to happen. Yeah, in order to have experience, sure. Yeah, I, well, um, I'm not sure whether you need consciousness. If you don't do the right thing, you die. Correct. So, so. Um, but so, why do you do the right thing or the wrong thing? Well, you both do the right thing. Some do the right thing. Some do the wrong things. The ones that do the wrong thing, they don't survive. Yeah, it's, just nat it's just natural selection. You know. To, to survive or to feel good. You know, Monod, Jacques Monod um, wrote his brilliant book *Chance and Necessity*. And he invented the word teleonomic, meaning the appearance of doing without doing. And uh, he, he's brilliant, he was a brilliant man. Uh, when we want to talk about these things, I can always hear Monod muttering in my ear. How do you know it's just not an evolved molecular machine? And that's what Steen is saying as well. It could be that, and, and most people would say it simply was, in the absence of consciousness, natural selection will select out those systems able to evaluate, sense their worlds, evaluate their environment, and act reliably on it, but teleonomically in, in Monod's sense. Thanks to Jean Monod would say, grâce à sélection naturelle. Thank you, to, thanks to natural selection. So we may invoke the possibility that there's conscious experience, but I don't think we have to. I wish we did. So, so, so I don't know, another way to think about it is that the way the world is made is somehow um, a reflection of, uh, I don't know, consciousness. Uh, and and then, uh, then, then it, it all comes from there. Uh, so that has a sort of a spiritual um, undertone or overtone. And I can, um, I can live with that too. Uh, so, so then natural selection is a consequence of uh, uh, of uh, how the matter is made, and the matter is made of this ultimate cause that we can call consciousness or God, I don't know. Um, so I think one of the things that is really, like if, if we all had the same feeling, we would have less possibilities of the things that we would generate. So if you think about life as this generative process, it's really important that people have different feelings and different perceptions of the world because they're going to create different things. Um, and so, so one way I think about it is like, like we have theories for thermodynamics that count number of states, and, and those are, are ensemble theories. So they talk about um, you know, averages over many possible worlds. But if you ask about how the, the physical world could really instantiate as many possible states or possible futures as possible, it's really important for us to have different experiences because that's a better generative mechanism. So, so within the information framework, if you think information actually really is doing these kind of things, there, there may be some natural ways of thinking about why we have such diversity of human experience or feelings. Just for the record, I have a paper called How Life Evolved to Feel Good. If anybody wants to see it, email me. I'll send it to you. Uh, yeah, I'd like to throw this out. It seems to connect to what's just been said in that uh, it seems to me that a good portion of the direction of evolution from these very early little cells and protocells to us is governed by, uh, you could say, life learning how to manage instability. Because once you get 
a species that's evolved to fill a niche, that niche gives it a stability. And that makes it difficult for that species to change. But if there's a possibility of self-monitoring and some kind of adaptive control, then you can exist in a state that otherwise would be unstable and gain flexibility to change in terms of environmental change. So I'd just like to throw that out as something for a comment. Um, one of the most fascinating things for us is that in the earliest phases, as we're now in the thought experiments territory of the progenote world, which is rickety chemistry, it's like no species, right? It's just protocellular masses. It's a consortium model that that that, micro, uh, that uh, micro, microbiologists talk about, or or microbial map people talk about. And it's all horizontal transfer. There's like almost in the progenote world, there'd be no vertical descent. It's like this smush of shared stuff. It's all probabilistic. And if you actually go to Yellowstone, you see this. If you go to Yellowstone, the slight change in the flow of liquid out of a hot spring changes the, exquisitely changes the microbial community in its thickness and what's on top and what's on bottom and what's in the middle. And they all, they assume all these shapes, just a, adapting just to local conditions, exquisitely local. So I think that life for billions of years was exquisitely localized, but on a continuous basis where there's no speciation going on. Just a little bit more photosynthesis here because you have access to it, but chemosynthesis here because you have access to it. And we have to actually rethink. If you're thinking about the origin of life and the first 90% of life on Earth, you have to think in a different term than you know, species competing. It, it's, a it was a different world. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry, we have to end this now. Uh, we're over time, and there's a film screening over in the Catalina Ballroom over in the hotel, and they have to set this room up for the banquet. So let's give our speakers, all four of them, a, a round of applause, and thank the audience for hanging in there and asking such great questions, and thank you all. <laughs>